Caleb, thank you for having me on the Fintro pod. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, Edwin, the name that puts fear in fraud's eyes. Um, so those of you who don't know, Edwin has a newsletter called The Bear Cave, uh, which you should certainly subscribe to. And he started a new project called Idea Brunch, and it's great. Um, do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Uh, absolutely, Caleb. Uh, so uh, I write two newsletters. My main one is called The Bear K, which is focused on exposing corporate misconduct. Every week, I send an email recapping new activist short campaigns, interesting executive resignations, interesting tweets to about 25,000 people who read the newsletter. Anyone can sign up just by Googling The Bear Cave newsletter. And then that's the free version. And there's a paid version of the newsletter where twice a month I'll write about a company that's hurt, misleading investors, hurting customers, doing something wrong. It's usually short, about a 1, thousand, fifteen hundred word write up. Um, I re file a lot of FOIA requests, read a lot of lawsuits, look at a lot of resignations and just try to find the worst companies out there, oftentimes facts. So I write the barricade news that are focused on all the bad companies in the market. And then recently, about three months ago, I started a second newsletter called Idea Brunch. And every Sunday, I publish a written interview with a hedge fund manager, usually someone really smart who's managing less than $500 million. And I ask them about their investment process, how they research companies, um, and ask them to pitch their best two or three ideas. And that newsletter, you know, has gotten really popular. I think about 3,000 people are reading it just three months in. And anyone can sign up for that. Um, there's going to be a link for Idea Brunch somewhere. Uh, and so those are my two newsletters. I'm 23. This is my sole source of income. And I spend a lot of time reaching out to up and coming hedge fund managers to interview them and looking for the bad companies in the market to expose them. Yeah, that's great. Um, I personally read some and I, I do advise everybody to go subscribe. Um, one of the one of the popular ones you've done is care.com. Can you speak about that a little bit? Yeah, so so care.com was a company I wrote about in college that got a lot of attention and kind of put me on the map and allowed me to build a Twitter following, which I then used to launch my newsletter. Care.com was my first big campaign against a bad company, and it's a really funny story. Care.com was the largest babysitting platform in the US. I heard from a friend who was a babysitter on there that, hey, you should look into this platform. It's kind of sketchy. I don't think they're betting the babysitters like they claim to be doing. I knew it was a billion dollar publicly traded company. So I'm like, perfect, let me dig into this. And, you know, I just started Googling and, you know, there was just all these safety instances where like a babysitter who had been like arrested on a drug conviction was hired on care.com or like babysitters with DUIs were hired through care.com. I'm like, this is a little odd since the company claims to be vetting people. Let me check it out for myself. So I go to care.com's website and I apply to be a babysitter, but I apply as Harvey Weinstein. I make up, a, I use Harvey Weinstein's image. I use his name. I make up a social security number, make up an address, make up this whole fake profile for Harvey Weinstein on care.com. And uh, I go through the application process. They, I check a box saying they can run a background check. And at the end, they're like, we got your application. We'll get back to you within a week on whether or not you're approved. I'm like, there's no way they approve me. This is obviously a fake account. They're running a back, or they say they're running a background check. No, I am approved. One week later, I'm approved. I'm on the platform. I made a fake Facebook account. And like I'm like listed as like a trusted babysitter <coughs> with the second highest level of authenticity. And I'm like, there's a major problem here. They're saying they're running background checks, but they're not. And I read a lot of lawsuits against them. And I found instances where like care.com babysitters have killed kids. And they had prior criminal histories and parents could pay more for background checks to care.com. And those background checks wouldn't have obviously like fake accounts. And it was just a complete mess because if you're a babysitting platform, you know, safety is the number one issue. So I, I publish a little report on them. Uh, on Twitter, it goes viral, it gets a little attention and the company decides to call Stanford, my college, to try to get me in trouble. And Stanford 
gnarly, you know, a bunch of like alums were on care.com's board and I'm sure there were donors. There's some dark magic going on. Stanford then called me into the Dean's office and they're like, you need to take this report down. You violated our Wi-Fi policy by impersonating Harvey Weinstein. This is an ethics violation. This is very serious. And I just refused to take it down. And I continued to criticize the company. I filed FOIA requests with every state attorney general for consumer complaints against the company. I sent it to a ton of reporters. And to make a long story short, nine months later, the Wall Street Journal runs a front page story on safety issues at care.com. They cite me and my report, and I get a little mention in the Wall Street Journal. And the CEO, CFO, and general counsel all resign. The company stock falls more than 50%, and it ends up sold to IAC, which did implement proper safety practices. Um, and that and that got me some attention on Twitter and, you know, gave me a little bit of credibility in the marketplace, which then allowed me my senior year to launch my newsletter and get people to sign up. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That's that's a great story. And uh, you, that really proves you can find short ideas anywhere. And who knows what would happen if they were still a public company? Um, do you have any any other favorite Bear Cave uh, write ups that you've done? So I've written on a lot of bad companies out there, Caleb, um, but I'll give you three kind of companies that I think stand out as some of the worst companies out there. One was Root Insurance. They IPO two years ago, like $10 billion market cap or something crazy, and they claimed to be revolutionizing insurance by uh, they had an app and the app would track you 24-7 for two weeks. And they could tell based on like your phone's movement, whether you were driving, where you were driving, what times you were driving, your braking, your turning radius, all these things, or at least they claim to be able to. And by using this app to track you, they can determine if you're a good driver and only underwrite to the good drivers and only give the best drivers great rates and it would work great in insurance. And, you know, they go public. They weren't profitable at the time. They say our algorithm is going to get better and soon will be profitable. And the market really believed them and thought they had a unique product. And I started looking into them and I see right away there's tons of consumer complaints on them. And the consumer complaints were a really consistent theme. I signed up at a great rate with Root Insurance. And six months later, they raised the prices 25, 30 percent, even in the pandemic when no one was driving. And they claimed, oh, the weather in your area is getting worse. The cost of repairs is going up. So always there's some excuse. And all these people who signed up at a great rate are just getting these heights every six months. And they say, we try to cancel, but the whole times are three hours. There's no way to cancel in an app. They have this PO box that I don't know. Like, and they make it tough to cancel. So Wall Street was looking at this company saying, look, their cohorts are getting more profitable over time. They're going to be profitable. They have this great technology. But the consumers, you know, have this really hidden problem where they're actually just locked in and the company's making it difficult to cancel. And you can tell sooner or later, people are gonna cancel, people are gonna leave. This isn't how an ethical company acts. There was one complaint where like a woman on disability was writing her attorney general being like, I can't figure out how to cancel, blah, blah, blah. And just really awful stuff. And I just wrote it up, the stock fell a little. And you know, a year later, the company's gone from 20 to two, about two thirds of their companies, have, <laughs> two thirds of their customers have left within one year of them going public. And it was just like, this is just nonsense. And it was kind of obvious nonsense if you were looking at from the consumer perspective, but Wall Street often just gets focused too much on the numbers and modeling and not enough on the company's relationship with its customers. So Root Insurance is one great example. Uh, another great example of a company that was kind of nonsense was Ag Eagle Aerial Systems. The ticker is UABS, and they were going to make next generation drones to deliver Amazon packages. And they said, they hinted that there was gonna be a partnership with Amazon, retail investors take the stock from one to $20 billion market cap. And you just start looking into it. Like they had no revenue. It's like, how many employees do they have? Eight, 
How much have they spent on R and D? Like forty thousand dollars, and then you're like, what, "What is the product actually?" And it's just like a remote controlled helicopter with a GoPro attached. And then they're like, "Oh, you know, the Amazon partnership didn't happen, but we're going to actually make drones to like monitor marijuana fields, so you can tell if the weeds growing well." It's like this is just such nonsense. And oh, who's involved? These tiny stock promoters that have been tied to other like companies that go down ninety percent, and it's just like clear there's no substance there there's no there there they're just running the stock promotion it turns out the rumors of the amazon partnership where the chairman's daughter made a video that like had the amazon logo and the company's logo and retail investors they just <laughs> just such nonsense and i wrote about it and the stock went from like 20 to 3 and you know it's down like 90 percent. and that's another example of a company that just completely lacks substance. So I'll, I'll stop with those two, but th th there's, no, there's no, you know, shortage of nonsense companies out there right now. And my newsletter is focused on exposing them. Yeah, that is, that's insane. Um, it, it really sounds like they just, they start to mislead people and they get like kind of caught up in a lie and they don't know how to get out. So. <laughs> You know, my Mark Cahota is one of my mentors said, it always starts with a little bit of fraud. You, you, you know, especially with these bigger companies is you channel stuff a little, you pull forward sales a little, you offer someone a discount to buy at the end of this quarter so you can book extra revenue. And then next quarter, you need to do a little bit more. And then yeah. eventually, you know, slight amounts of channel stuffing or small fraud devolves into big fraud because you got to keep covering it up. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, that's a little bit about the Bear Cave and Idea Brunch. Um, definitely subscribe, guys. It's it's wonderful. Um, so can we get a little bit of background just about yourself? Absolutely, Caleb. So I've been passionate about stocks from a really young age. Like second grade, I was all about the stock market. My grandmother put some money in an E-Trade account and gave me the username and password so I could trade it on her behalf. Uh, and then high school is when I started writing online on Seeking Alpha a bit. I started meeting some hedge fund managers. And freshman year of college is when things really changed for me because by coincidence, I got introduced to two of the best short sellers out there. Mark Cahodes, who is a private individual and just uses Twitter to expose bad companies, and Jim Carruthers, who used to run a billion dollar hedge fund. Um, and I interned for him on and off. And he was like a veteran short seller. And he introduced me to all the people in the short selling world, really taught me how to research <laughs> companies, how to find bad companies, how to read lawsuits, stuff like that, how to file FOIA requests. And that's what really elevated my game to a next level and was a true game changer for me. But senior year, when it was time to graduate college, uh, uh, you know, I, th that hedge fund was shutting down. I was talking to all these people in New York City, but I just knew I wouldn't like it because it was very hierarchical. They focus a lot on modeling. They all wear suits and ties. It's not my vibe. So I decided to do what I, I always done is start writing online and, you know, see if people will pay attention. So there was this new tool called Substack that had come out that allowed anyone to create an email newsletter. I created an email newsletter that was free, focused on the short world. And right away, you know, a thousand people signed up within six months, 3000 people were on it and people were like, you should charge for it. And then I started charging for it. And within two months, it was earning like a hundred grand a year. And I'm like, okay, this is definitely going to work. This is what I should focus my time on. And, you know, it's just taken off since then. And the one thing I skipped was care.com, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you really you really blew up and that's awesome. The newsletters are great and you definitely provide some value to the marketplace. So well, thank you, Caleb. Um I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Um so you you said you 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 kind of dabbled into the hedge fund world while you're still in college, but uh didn't want really want to take that route. Um so why the newsletter, I guess? So it wasn't that I didn't want to take the hedge fund route. It's more that just, especially in New York City, just culturally, it just wouldn't fit with me. I like looking at stocks. I like researching companies. I don't like getting yelled at. I don't like people <laughs> being mean to other people. I don't like focusing on nonsense. I don't really have a tolerance for like unethical games. Like, you know, and that's what a lot of the hedge fund world is. Yeah. Um, 
so, so the news that I originally you thought this was going to be a great way to network with people is people are going to read it. They're going to think, you know, I'm smart if I'm smart. And then someone great will come and offer me a job. And I thought this newsletter is the way to find the perfect job. And the other problem is <coughs> when you're a senior in college, even if you're good, you know, what is it like? You, you know, you, the most you're going to earn is like $100,000 a year. You can't get a hedge fund to be like, this guy is outstanding. We're going to pay him $500,000 a year. And it's, it's just like, yeah. you know, there's just all these problems when you're young. You just can't have an awesome first job and a ton of autonomy, even though that's what I wanted. So I thought I'll do this newsletter. I'll show the world that I can actually do great research. And then someone's going to come and offer me a crazy great opportunity. And that kind of happened. I started to meet tons of interesting people. But I also learned I liked writing this newsletter. I could write on a company and people would reach out and it might impact the stock. It might actually change the company's practices. Like a lot of times companies might change their websites a little after I write on them. And I, I just got hooked on it. And it was really fun. And I was super lucky. You know, I'm graduating right as this tool substack, which makes it impossibly easy to start a newsletter where it was becoming popular. If that tool didn't exist, I don't know where I'd be, but it definitely wouldn't be here. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you're, you're, uh, you're living a, a great 23 year old's life. So yeah, you, you really, you really got that going. Um, so what's kind of the end goal for the newsletter and your business in general? So it's always tough when you're young to like really see too far into the future. Six months seems yeah. like such a long time to me. Right now, I got 25,000 people on my email list, about 25,000 free subscribers, about 1,500 paying subscribers. And I do really cool work with the Bear Cave and do good interviews. So the two things I got to do no matter what are keep exposing bad companies, do good investigations into bad companies and bring those problems out to light. That's priority number one. Priority number two, continue to do awesome written interviews with cool hedge fund managers, like smart people. Those are the two things I got to keep doing. Those are the recipes to success. Now, my third option is I can use kind of my network to raise a hedge fund. The problem with that for my future is, you know, hedge funds, the one benefit of it is you earn a lot of money. The negative of it is you probably need to shut down all your newsletters and your lifestyle changes. You mentioned I have a great lifestyle. It's like, yeah, I can sleep in as much as I want. No one's calling me. No one's telling me what to do. I can literally just do whatever I want every day as long as you know I, I, I spend some time to find bad companies and spend two hours a week to find someone to interview. It's just a great lifestyle. And you give that up when you launch a hedge fund or you work for someone else. And so I kind of don't want to do that. What I could see myself doing is either really take the investigations to the next level, hire an attorney, hire a private investigator, spend a ton of money doing edgy investigations, trying to expose the worst conduct out there. I probably won't do that. What I could see myself doing is growing my audience even more, 50,000 Twitter followers, 25,000 email, 1,500 people paying, and use that to launch new products. Because the toughest thing with launching a new product isn't building a great product, it's getting an audience, getting that distribution. And I have this distribution and trust the readers, so I could see myself launching new newsletters or launching uh, like an educational product, like a, maybe like a masterclass for finance in the future, something like that. Uh, th that's what I could see myself focusing on a lot. Um, if I can continue to do well with the newsletters and want to pursue a new venture. I'm sure you will, you will continue to do well. Uh, but yeah, th that's an awesome uh, vision for the next few years, I guess. Um, so short sellers get a common misconception. Um, everyone, well, not everyone, but a lot of people that are uninformed think they're bad and they hurt, hurt some companies. Um, can you speak to that at all? Because people need to know that short sellers do provide some value in the marketplace. Absolutely. So short sellers are betting against companies and no company I know of has ever failed because short sellers are betting against them. No legitimate company has ever failed because short sellers are betting against them. Because in the long run, a company determines its own fate. Does it produce a good drug? Does it produce a good product? Does, is it profitable in the long run? Like in the short run, the, the market's a voting machine, but in the long run, it's a weighing machine, weighing companies' values, and that is in a company's own control. 
Where short sellers can provide a lot of value and actually impact the outcome is identifying fraud and wrongdoing. Regulators are more like financial archaeologists. They can tell you what went wrong after the fact. Journalists and short sellers who kind of function as journalists if they publish stuff online are active in uncovering stuff as it happens because they have a financial incentive. So a lot of big frauds like Enron in the past, short sellers were the early whistleblowers. They go to journalists who write about things and then it collapses. And it's good to have frauds collapse early because otherwise they grow and are bigger and then collapse later and impact more people. Another great example of a short seller providing a lot of value is Mark Cahotes. He noticed irregularities at a company called MyMedx that made like skin grafts from placentas and sold it to the like government. And it turns out they were overbilling the government. They were channel stuffing. They were misleading investors <laughs> about supplier relationships. He blows the whistle on it, publishes a video on it, publishes articles on them. Journalists pay attention. Regulators pay attention. The end result is the CEO and CFO ended up in jail Government find them a lot. Their practice is improved. And that's an example where the stock did go down because of him. But it went down because the company was doing wrong stuff that he brought to light. It wasn't his fault that went down. In fact, he helped the government recoup money and uh, really identify wrongdoing there. So to me, at its best, activist short sellers, they make money when a stock falls, but they make money by exposing misconduct and kind of acting like a journalist in a way. Um, at its worst, though, you might be incentivized to spread false allegations to get a stock to go down and cover the next day. That doesn't happen as frequently as I think some people think it does, but it does happen. Those people, though, lose credibility really quickly. The one thing that matters a ton is credibility. If some no-name anonymous person starts saying this company is a fraud, no one will pay attention because, you know, you don't have credibility. Yeah, th those credible activist short sellers, um, they really protect some retail investors that don't know exactly what they're doing. So there's definitely value in that. Um, so something that's that's been pretty popular recently, AMC, um, it's, it's brought a lot of retail investors into the marketplace. Um, and they all love the, the CEO, Adam Aaron. And Adam Aaron has just been selling his stock what do you think about this situation? So you see people like short sellers are bad. I think CEOs who like pump up their stocks with nonsense and then sell a ton yeah. are kind of bad. Uh, I don't get it. It's just a dying movie chain. GameStop actually does have a turnaround happening and it's probably a very valuable company. AMC is just, it looks like a dead company to me. And, you know, instead of, you know, trying to focus on executing the business well, he just seems the CEO, Adam Aaron, seems more involved in like building a hype with retail investors who will end up likely losing all their money. So it's really sad. It's bad. Yeah. I hope there's some consequences, but there probably won't be. And he can sell tens of millions of dollars of inflated stock into the market with kind of no consequences. Um, it's one of the problems when you have so many retail investors involved is you can get companies that are like, you know, just not worth that much, like AMC or Ag Eagle Aerial Systems on complete puffery, a huge valuation. You get all the insiders, investment banks uh, make money and retail is left holding the bag. So that's a sad situation. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, pr it's a pretty crazy sh situation. Um, I've never seen anything quite that drastic in my lifetime. Um, <laughs> So it it is interesting to see to to see to say the least. Um, okay, so here here's more of a fun question. Let's say I'm a new retail investor and I hate one clothing brand, I love another. Um, why should I not just go out and short a clothing brand that I don't like? So a big thing with investing is what's priced into the market. You can say JC Penny is a dying brand, but if everybody knows it's a dying brand, it's probably going to be priced very low and that information is going to be priced in. So it's not just what insights do you have, what insights do you have that the market is missing? Uh, so because you, it might be a dying brand, it might not be a popular brand, but the market might know that. And its value actually might be that it has a lot of cash on its balance sheet and it might actually own its land or leases, which have a lot of value in and of itself. It might have a, you know, a separate brand, a uh, commerce brand that's actually a little popular. Companies are usually pretty nuanced and complex and have different divisions. So 
you know, you don't want to just shoot from the hip and say, oh, I, I know this little aspect. You need to understand the whole company and where the value is. Occasionally, though, it could work. Um, but you need to see what's priced in and understand the company holistically in order to make a good decision. Yeah, it, I mean, it's definitely more complicated than some some people assume. Uh, something you said earlier, um, I think you said in the short term, the stock market's a voting machine, but in the long term, it's a weighing machine. Yeah. Um, that I mean, that that's interesting. I've never really thought thought about it like that. So yeah, that's a quote from Ben Graham, and what it what it kind of means is in the short run, it's almost like a popularity contest. You're just voting on what you think is popular or not popular. That's what causes all the oscillations. But in the long run, over the next 10, 20 years, what matters is that value of the company. And even if it's hated, if a company like Tesla is actually selling a ton of cars, the value is going up. If you know a company you know, just, you know, like JC Penny, even if investors thought there was value there in the long run, just the weight of the company, the value of the company is what dictates. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. So a follow up question. What's the perfect recipe for a short? For me, what I really like to see is when Wall Street and the numbers show one thing, but there's actually something else going on. So if root insurance is showing great cohort analysis and the people building models are saying one thing, but then you just focus on its relationship to the customers and all the customers are pissed and trying to leave. It's like, that's just a, like a layup for me. And over and over again, Wall Street prioritizes numbers. These are easy to understand and model too much and not enough on the qualitative aspects of a company's relationship with its customers and like what's going on with the product. So I like the ones where the numbers show one thing and there's some qualitative issue that the market isn't priced again. Other times it's just pure puffery. So I talked about the drone company. There's a company called Embark Technology. It went public through a $4 billion SPAC deal. And then it's like the CEO is 26 and all the executives are like roommates and friends from college who are like 25, 24, 26. And they got one engineer from Tesla and he left after two years. And it's just like, there's just, a, and the company has no patents, even though competitors hold hundreds and they have like no revenue and they're being a little promotional. It's just like, you just get the feel. This is like, you know, just not worth that much. Um, so, so sometimes it's the numbers show one thing, the customers are saying something else. Other times it's just like pure puffery. Sometimes, especially with the US listed Chinese companies, there might just be outright fraud. Um, the, 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 usually a good short thesis is simple. The, the bad ones are ones where you, it takes 20 minutes to explain. Good ones are simple. Root insurance, they're screwing over customers and soon they're gonna leave. Ag Eagle Aerial Systems, their drones are actually nothing and it's pure hype. But, but, but <laughs> some people like to like get all complicated. We built this mod. The, the longer you need, it takes to explain it, the worse it usually is. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. Um, so what's a company, not necessarily a stock, but just a company, public or private, that you that you love or really appreciate? Let me think about that for a second, Caleb. Mm -hmm. I'll give two. Um, Amazon, I like, uh, because their goal, at least when Jeff Bezos first set out, he said it was to elevate consumers, uh, expectation for customer service. And they've done that. Do you totally now versus 10 years ago, expect to be able to get refunds easily, expect great online service. You expect things to be delivered quickly. You expect fair and reasonable prices. Amazon has single-handedly, not just done great customer service themselves, but changed, forced everyone to change and improve their customer service. Huge benefit for consumers there. You know, I, I, you know, it's a little sad to see them potentially mistreating their workers. I don't like that, but just, just this massive benefit in getting everyone to treat customers better, huge positive for society. The second company I absolutely love, it's my like major stock holding, Twitter. I'm obsessed with Twitter. It's how I come up with a lot of my ideas. It's how I do research. It's how I communicate to people. Over half my email subscribers come directly from Twitter. It's kind of an essential tool for any newsletter writer. Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. It's just an awesome way to express yourself, to learn, to meet new people. It's it, it it's just like LinkedIn. You never meet someone new through LinkedIn. It's just nonsense. Facebook. It's like just trashy now. Instagram, it's very superficial. Like maybe it's good for finding like, you know, a girl or guy your age to hang out with, but it's like just, 
Twitter, you learn, you meet people. I, everyone I interview for my newsletter, I usually DM them through Twitter. You can express yourself. You can get people to sign up for products. It's an incredibly, incredibly like beneficial company for anyone looking to learn and create and meet people. So I, I cannot speak more positively about Twitter. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I love Twitter also. Um, it, it seems like Twitter is kind of what LinkedIn wanted to be. But a little, a little less formal, I guess. But and but it's, it can be what you want. Some people use it for yeah, networking. Yeah. Other people use it to learn. Other people use it to share ideas. Other people use it to create like audio podcasts and interview people. It's it's just so incredible. Um, and the other thing is they're kind of like the anti Facebook, where Facebook focused a ton on monetization and didn't care about their users. Twitter will not do anything for an extra dollar that hurts users. They are very user focused, safety focused. And that's going to pay off in the long run. Yeah. And then also Amazon. I mean, I, I can order something and expect it one or two days from now. And I mean, 10, 15 years ago, there was no way that was happening. So what's some something you're anticipating or excited about in it, like in the next decade? Mm, let me think about that. Something I'm excited <laughs> about in the next decade. Uh, one thing that irritates me a lot now is stuff related to email newsletters, like things go to spam. Newsletters actually aren't sent instantaneously. Even if I schedule to send something at the same time, there's like logistical reasons things arrive in people's inboxes at slightly different times. I'm kind of excited to eventually, I think we're going to figure out like billing and communication a lot better. Where like one problem I have is people sign up for a newsletter, they change credit cards and usually you don't remember to to, you know, sign up for the barricade yeah. again. Uh, and, you know, I hate seeing like 2% of people leave every year because of that, you know, just things getting more seamless in that way. What else am I excited for? I, I don't know. I think the world's getting better quickly. It seems like maybe that there's some value there in the, I guess, cryptocurrency blockchain type of type of transactions, I guess. Maybe, maybe that can help make things more seamless. I'm not an expert. Um, I don't claim to be an expert. So that, that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, all right. So into some more, I guess, self-reflecting questions. Um, if you could be remembered for one thing, what would it be? Wow. Yeah. It's like I'm 80 now. I need to decide. But um, let's see. You know, I think I got a knack for exposing bad companies. I, you know, the, the end goal is if you can be one of those people that put a dent in humanity, change humanity for the better, it's tough to really like, you know, no matter what happens in your life, if you end up being one of those people that change the world for a better, you, you can end pretty satisfied. So I'd like to be known as the person who improved humanity the most. But, you know, that's yeah. that's a little bit of a long shot. Um, I don't think I don't think money after a certain point matters at all. Though, so, yeah, yeah. You, you can get there for sure. Um, so if you could have coffee, are you a coffee guy? No, water only. Water only. Wow. Okay. If, if you could have a lunch with <laughs> any historical figure, who would you like to have lunch with? I read this book on Clarence Darrow recently. He was a lawyer who fought for the poor, was very progressive, was against the death penalty, was just ahead of his time. Uh, he's somebody interesting I'd like to meet. He, he, he argued, I think, 50 death penalty cases, against the death penalty in 50 cases. And he won 49 of them. The first one he lost, he wasn't so lucky. So tough for that guy. But he, he, really, he really was like big on women's rights, big on having empathy, big on getting rid of the death penalty. You know, he always said, like, overcome hatred with love and temper justice with mercy. And I, I like that. I like people who, who focus on, you know, putting a drop of love in humanity. Yeah, I, I haven't heard of him, but I'll, I'll have to look him up and read about him a little bit. Um, okay, if you had to take all your money and store it in one asset for the rest of your life, where are you going? Easy question, Twitter. Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. Twitter. Okay, Twitter stock. 
Twitter stock. I mean, you know, one asset for the rest of your life. Then you're kind of forced to say S and P 500 index fund. But if it's like, if it's like, you know, one stock, I want to put most of my money away in for 20 years. Twitter, 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 Twitter. Easiest decision. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm glad you didn't take the easy way out and say like U.S. dollar or a mansion or something like that. I mean, U.S. dollar would be the worst thing to say. Because there could be a lot of inflation. That, that is an all-time worst answer. I don't think there's a worse answer than just saying, I want to cash. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Okay, so what, do you have a book that you really recommend to everybody? Let's see. Um, you know, Bad Blood by John Kerry Rue is a great book on the Theranos fraud. It just shows how things go wrong, how things are exposed. You get the human element of it. Generally, Wall Street Journal reporters who report on something then write a book on it are just outstanding. So Bad Blood by John Kerry Rue is a book I love. Uh, specifically for shorts, Dead Company is walking. It's not like A plus writing, but it just has a lot of case studies of companies that like go to zero. Uh, that's an interesting book. Um, I'm big on like podcasts and YouTube interviews. Uh, I think you can learn so much more by watching like interviews with Warren Buffett than you can from a book. And I'm also big on doing. I think you learn the most by doing and it really retains in your mind. Um, So that's what I would say. Awesome. All right. To wrap things up, this is what we'll do. I'm going to say something. You have to say long, short, or stay away. Okay. okay? All right. There, there's only about eight things. Okay. All right. Number one, Kathy Wood. Stay away. Ken Griffin. Stay away. <laughs> AMC. Short. Sure. Yes. Uh, cannabis companies. Stay away. Stay away. I agree. NFTs. Long. Elon Musk. Long ish, <laughs> uh, very low weight. Long, <clears throat> oh, okay. long yes. how about work from home? Long San Francisco real estate, long and Twitter spaces. Uh, very long, hyper long. <laughs> very long. That's funny. I knew you were a big advocate for Twitter, so I had to throw that in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, well, that's pretty much all I got. Is there anything else? Um, I didn't ask that you really wanted me to ask, I guess. Uh, no, Caleb, thanks for having me on the Fintro pod. I really yeah. appreciate it. People should follow me on Twitter or check out my newsletters, the Bear Cave and Sunday's Idea Brunch. But uh, I enjoyed it. And there's a lot of bad companies out there. And, you know, the one thing I guess my advice would be for any young person listening is the best way to get opportunities is to write online, publish things online, just go out there and do cool things in the world and things opportunities will just pop up yeah well you definitely do a lot of cool things in the world (laughs) thank you caleb i really appreciate you coming on um i had a great time absolutely thanks so much for having me